Normally at these sessions what I tend to do is look at contract cases and look at how the court deals with contracts because that's the sort of thing that we're dealing with all of the time. But today, because there has been such a raft of this, I'm going to also be looking at GDPR. I've been looking at uh, data protection, what's happened since GDPR came into force. Now that people are hopefully compliant with GDPR, they've got their policies in place, they've got their systems set up, how to respond to the rights of individuals. If you are either passing your people's data to a third party or promoting third party products, then in either case, that consent needs to be sufficiently granular to show whose product you're promoting or who you're passing that data to. One slight bit of good news for marketers is this case, which is Zerpler, which is a company that ran the usave.co website. All it does is provide third party offers, third party deals and that sort of thing. It had got consent from people, but it talked about providing third party offers, passing data or providing, promoting third party products and services. It was fined by the ICO, went to court of first instance. The court said, a consumer signing up to it knew that they would be getting third-party products and services. That was the point of the service. And so here, unusually, consent probably was sufficiently informed. So if you have still got that legacy wording of carefully selected third parties, if what you are doing is promoting third-party services and goods only, you may yet be able to rely on this judgment, or at least cite this judgment. The things that people have come to us with recently are their contracts, making sure their contracts are compliant, particularly the Article 28 wording from GDPR. That causes various issues and debates and discussions around who is controller, whether they're a controller or processor. The contract is actually a key part of that. And the sorts of questions you're asking in order to work out whether the person you're appointing is a controller or processor is, first of all, you know, do they decide what else that data is going to be used for? Do they actually make a decision as to what they, what they will do with the data? If so, they're probably a controller. Do they decide how long it's kept for? In which case, they're probably a controller. Will they be the ones responsible for responding to the subject access request? Will they be the ones notifying for a breach of the act or breach of uh, security? And will they be the ones liable where the information is incorrect? If so, again, they're probably a controller. The contract itself isn't neutral. In fact, the contract will largely determine which of these things will apply. The contract will set out how long the other person will keep the data for. It isn't a question of simply analysing the contract and applying it. You actually need to work out where you want to get to before you write the contract. The thing that gets raised in negotiations is, of course, the ICO fines. 20 million euro, 10 million euro for a processor. Actually, that's not the point with liability. And the reason is this, if you are in receipt of an ICO fine, first of all, the ICO will determine who is responsible and could fine either the controller or the processor or both, according to their culpability. But more significantly, of course, this is a civil penalty, monetary penalty notice, civil penalty, and typically you can't insure against it and you can't get an indemnity against it. So actually, liability when it comes to data protection is probably not about the fines, it's about everything else. It's about claims from third parties, it's about the damage to reputation, it's about what else you'll need to do in order to get back into a position where you can carry on with the contract. Talking of data breach notification, there is a form on the ICO's website which is quite useful. One question on the form, where it involves an individual who has caused a data security breach, and that can be quite simple, it can be simply you know, opening an email with a link on it. Where that individual has caused that breach, whether deliberately or not, there is a question that says, has that individual received GDPR training? If you deal with it according to the right procedure, you notify in the right time, the employee has been trained, they've done the right things, then you are much less likely to actually get a fine. Brexit is happening. Uh, there will be a hard Brexit unless something stops it, unless there's an agreement. So one clear thing is uh, data protection. So making sure that you're able, if you're a large organisation, passing data from the UK into Europe and vice versa, making sure that you've got an agreement in place that allows for that data transfer. Things will take time, they'll cost money, and you need to get preparations in place. There's a very, very real deadline of 31st of March. If nothing happens, 
then on 31st of March, we will suddenly become, if nothing else is agreed, a third country. So we'll no longer be part of the EU. We do have GDPR in place, which is an equivalent law, so we will still be able to send personal data to the EU. But there's no way of knowing yet whether the EU will be able to provide personal data to the UK. There is no adequacy decision as yet, an adequacy decision which would say effectively the UK has got equivalent data protection laws to the EU. Adequacy decision typically takes two years to come to fruition. We haven't started. It's in six months time. If nothing else happens, there will be a problem sending personal data to the UK. If you are a business that's based in various countries, get an agreement in place. The agreement will cover the model clauses. Those model clauses can be part of an intergroup agreement. You may also want to look at your contracts. So if your contracts refer to an exclusivity within the EU, then you may want to look at what that means. If you're importing or exporting, there are likely to be customs duties. Some businesses who are in logistics for instance, this is really quite a significant deal because they've got various service levels about delivery within a certain time, which they may not be able to meet post-Brexit. Even if you're not providing goods and services to the EU, even if you are only providing goods and services to the US or Canada or various other third countries, at the moment you are not taxed twice on sales to the US and sales to Canada because there's a double taxation treaty. It's an EU double taxation treaties, of which we will no longer have benefit unless something is agreed come 1st of April next year. Which means actually, suddenly, sales to the US, to Canada, so nothing to do with Europe, will be taxed twice. Some of these things will take time to rectify. They're things that don't need necessarily to happen now, but you don't want to be thinking about them on the 31st of March because it will be too late. There will be a period where you, you don't have the protection in place. It always used to be the case that um, a no variations clause, the clause that says there will be no variations to this contract unless made in writing and signed, those sorts of clauses were always a bluff because parties could always change a contract. Now the Supreme Court has said actually it does work for contractual certainty, it's significant what's written in the contract. For some time, yes you can say no variations, but if in fact you orally agree something different, then of course you varied the contract, because you can vary any contract by subsequent agreement. And it was the case in the Court of Appeal on Rock Advertising and MWB Business Exchange, this is an advertising agency contract, in writing, varied orally. Court of Appeal said, yes, that variation is valid, but the Supreme Court on 16th of May actually reversed that entirely, which is why this is a significant case, and said, for contractual certainty, it should be the case that a clause that says there will be no variations will be valid. So it does change the law quite significantly. People will be going away and thinking of various things. There'll be some things to think about in terms of GDPR, things like liability, things like indemnities. They'll be looking at their contractual wording and they'll also hopefully just be starting to think about Brexit and just be starting to think about the sort of news that they might have to give to their business because actually March really isn't that far away and there are some things that they may need to do before 31st of March.